محمد وعلى آل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد رسول كريم رؤوف رحيم سراج منير محمد أول العابدين خاتم النبيين رحمة للعالمين محمد يا ربي صل على نبيك دائما في هذه الدنيا وبعث ثاني يا ربي صل على نبيك دائما في هذه الدنيا وبعث ثاني Assalamu alaikum. Peace be on you. Good evening. On behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat at Calgary, it's my pleasure to welcome you to all you all to this virtual World Religions Conference. The Calgary chapter of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat has regularly held interface events across Alberta, but with the arrival of COVID-19 and compliance with the health authorities being our top priority, we've had to change things. As a result, the World Religions Conference has gone online this year. My name is Dr. Dan Haas. I'm currently serving as the Chair of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Discipline Head for Philosophy at Red Deer College. I completed an, an undergraduate degree at the University of Calgary, followed by a master's in philosophy at Simon Fraser, and I finished my formal education with a doctorate in philosophy from Florida State University. I work mainly in the philosophy of mind, particularly in the philosophy of action and free will, um, but I'm also very interested in moral, social, and political philosophy and the history and philosophy of the sciences. I've had the privilege of working with the Ahmadiyya for the past five years now as co-organizer and moderator for the Red Deer uh, College iteration of these conferences. Uh, Red Deer College and the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat have been partners putting together this conference annually at Red Deer in, in the city of Red Deer for the past 15 years. And this will be the first year where, you know, unfortunately due to COVID, we've been unable to meet in person. We're hoping to return to physical meetings across the province very, very soon. Uh, this year's conference is on the important topic of the global pandemic. We've titled it Global Pandemic, an Opportunity to Make Peace. Over the past few months, the world has been shaken to its core as a result of COVID-19. Countries were brought to a standstill in a way that seemed previously impossible. The rise of, COVID, of the coronavirus has exposed the fallibility and fragility of nations and human beings. As the whole world suffered, it required a global and unified effort uh, to contain and combat COVID-19. Yet regrettably, instead of unity, uh, further division and conflict has been all too apparent as countries and leaders have blamed one another rather than seeking to build trust and support each other. The economic consequences of COVID-19 are set to exacerbate and compound this misery and could easy, easily further destabilize the peace and security of the, of the world as a result. Are the paralyzing and devastating effects of the pandemic a warning to mankind to reform and forego all forms of injustice? Is the current pandemic an opportunity to recognize uh, the creator and to fulfill the rights of his creation? How can faith leaders help foster a spiritual or mutual cooperation between the world communities? To seek answers to these questions and provide you with an opportunity to ask your own questions, um, we've assembled a panel of learned scholars from atheism, Hinduism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, today's event being a virtual program, we're at the mercy of technology. And even with the best efforts, sometimes things can go, and go wrong. So we implore you to bear with us and hope for the best. Now, a brief agenda for tonight. We're going to start with a recitation from the Holy Quran, a brief introduction to the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat and the World Religion Conference. This will be followed by presentations from the panelists, as I've said, representing atheism, Hinduism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, there will be messages from other, uh, fr from uh, many of the friends of the World Religion Conference. All this will be followed by a question and answer session and uh, a brief closing remark. So to begin, I'd like to request Saeed Labi Janud uh, to recite a portion from the Holy Quran and present a translation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. 
May the peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah be upon you all. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَمِيثَاقَهُ الَّذِي وَاثَقَكُمْ بِهِ إِذْ قُلْتُمْ سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَاتْ ولا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم على ألا تعدلوا اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى وال اتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون. I will now present the English translation of the verses just recited, taken from chapter 5 of the Holy Quran, verses 8 and 9. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the accursed, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, ever merciful. And remember Allah's favor upon you and the covenant which he made with you when you said, we hear and we obey and fear Allah. Surely Allah knows well what is in your minds. O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in equity. And let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just. That is nearer to righteousness. And fear Allah. Surely Allah is aware of what you do. Jazakallah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, just uh, remind everybody, or I guess tell, tell everybody that's watching us tonight, um, we are going to have a question and answer session at the end. Um, so I'd, I'd like to request all of all of our viewers to um, text any questions or comments you have to 587-200-5359. Again, that number is 587-200-5359. Um, up next, I'll provide a brief introduction to the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat and the World Religion Conferences. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat is an international revival movement within Islam, uh, and they have members in over 200 countries. Uh, some of the key Islam teachings or concept, uh, concepts practiced by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat are that they believe all human beings are created equal, irrespective of their race, their color, their creed, or their gender. Uh, only those are better who are more conscious of their creator and act accordingly. However, it is God's prerogative to decide. Life is a chance to recognize our creator. And death makes us meet our creator and face judgment day. So we need to be watchful of our acts in this world. Um, and then peaceful coexistence in this world is fundamental and it is over and above any religious belief. Uh, the golden principle for interfaith harmony uh, the, whole, the holy founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat at Hadrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed says, God has informed me that of 
of the religions which have spread and are firmly established in the world through prophets, holding sway over a part of the world and achieving survival and long life, none was false in its origin, nor, were, nor was any of those prophets false, because it, is, because it is the eternal practice of God that a false prophet who lies against God, who is not fought from God, but dares to forge things for himself, never prospers. A gift for the queen, page four. Uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat uh, uh, focuses on promoting peace. They reject all forms of extremism. The founder of the community, Hadrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the promised Messiah and the Mahdi, declared that extremism and an aggressive jihad with the sword has no place in Islam. The best way to defend Islam is through an intellectual jihad with the pen. To this end, Ahmed penned over 80 books and 10,000s of letters, delivered hundreds of lectures, and he engaged in scores of public debates. The motto of this community is love for all, hatred for none. Now, the World Religion Conferences are an opportunity to exchange ideas and explore topical issues in a spirit of mutual respect. Um, they were so envisioned by the holy founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat over a century ago. Uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat affirmed the value of interfaith, interactions for enriching our awareness of the, our awareness of the divine being in the world. And in Canada, these symposium and conferences have been held for over four decades. Now, the World Religion Conference has been going on for, uh, you know, several years uh, in Alberta. Um, the conference has covered a wide variety of topics over those years, from gender equality to human suffering, to living a meaningful life, to the relationship between science and religion. And tonight's uh, contribution, you know, dealing with the pandemic and um, how we as you know, religions and citizens and you know, faith traditions should respond to it. You know, that's gonna be another great topic. So I'm very pleased uh, to introduce our panel of uh, speakers for tonight. With us tonight to discuss global pandemic and opportunity to make peace is uh, Caroline Russell King, uh, representing atheism. Hello, Caroline. Um, Pankaj Dulabai, representing Hinduism. Uh, Pastor David Benjamin, representing Christianity, and Imam Asif Araf, representing Islam. Now, before we get started tonight, um, I mentioned at the outset that we have a number of partners that have been holding World Religion Conferences alongside the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat for past several years. And many of those uh, friends have um, agreed, to, they've, they've sent in messages uh, to be part of this um, tonight's, I guess, event. So um, we're gonna start off with a message from Professor Jim Linville from the University of Lethbridge. Um, Lethbridge is one of the venues of the World Religion Conference. It's regularly in the schedule. And again, unfortunately, we could not hold a Lethbridge World Religion Conference this year due to COVID. We are glad that Professor Jim Linville, head of the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Lethbridge has sent us the following message for the conference. Let's listen to uh, Professor Linville. Oh, greetings from sunny Lethbridge. I hope all of you are bearing up well in these very trying times. With the virus and the, all the associated economic troubles and political troubles here and there, many of us are severely tested, as are our uh, diverse communities. I should say I'm glad to be associated with these World Religions Conferences. Um, I've always been made to feel very welcome, and I think they do a lot of good. And with all the stresses placed on us nowadays, communications between groups um, is as important as maintaining personal ties with our family and friends, even if we can't physically meet on more open or free terms. Interfaith and intercultural dialogue is central to the goals of a free society. Without it, people can tend to insulate the themselves against all that is different. And when societies are threatened with one calamity or another, political, economic, or environmental, people can, can become very exclusionary and defensive, which can only make matters worse for everyone. And I think we're seeing a lot of that sort of thing in the world today. But even as tensions in the world seem to be mounting on many fronts, many women and men of diverse cultures, faiths, and philosophical persuasions are striving to make the world more equal, more peaceful. 
All of these efforts need to be celebrated so we do not lose hope in such, a in such trying times. A lot of what we see in the news of civil strife and disagreement is not simply anger, but also hope for a better world, a reluctance to surrender to values that leave too many marginalized, ostracized, excluded, or to make them victims of violence. And I think these world uh, religions conferences do play into this formation of hope. And so I'm very, very uh, pleased to be part of them. Um, and I hope once public gatherings again are permitted, we can continue with these conferences as they do so much good in bringing people together. And so I'll leave with my best wishes for health and happiness for you and all of your loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Linville. So our, our first speaker of the night uh, representing uh, atheism is gonna be Carolina, Caroline Russell King. Caroline is a playwright and she's written over 30 plays and she's had six, over 60 productions across Canada and the US. She is a member and former vice president of the Playwrights, Playwrights Guild of Canada. She also is a member of the Dramatists Guild of America and the literary managers and dramaturgs of the Americas. As a volunteer, Caroline has worked with committee against, the Committee Against Racism, teaching, uh, teaching unlearning racism workshop. She was a multicultural change facilitator with the United Way, and she's worked with, the, uh, with Amnesty International. Caroline is a member of the Atheist Society of Calgary and the Center for Inquiry. She has founded the Non-Religious Liberty Task Force, which works on issues of separation of church and state in Alberta. So uh, welcome, uh, Caroline. Thank you. And, uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging all of the hardworking people who came together to bring tonight's events from concept to reality. Conferences are difficult, but especially challenging during a pandemic. I'd like to thank Malika and Sultan Mahmood for inviting me back. I'm impressed that the World Religions Conference again is including an atheist perspective in this conversation. Distinguished panelists, honorable participants, fellow primates. I'm not gonna dwell on the pandemic's death, pain and suffering and subsequent economic fallout, which in turn creates more pain and suffering. People are afraid. Fear is the proverbial double-edged sword. Fear is the one thing that has helped keep our species alive through millennia, but it can also lead us as humans to turn on each other. We especially want to hold someone or something accountable for all the injustice and pain we see around us. As humans and very afraid humans, we can unite when we come to the realization that our common enemy is the virus. We can come together in solidarity around this. My position is that the two things that are gonna help us defeat it are science and empathy. I'd be willing to bet that despite the differences in our backgrounds, our religious positions, our philosophical points of view and our politics, I'm willing to bet that my fellows understand science and have huge amounts of empathy. I think overwhelmingly the kind of people who attend conferences to learn and be exposed to other points of view don't refute scientific facts about the virus that has infected and killed millions. If others choose to deny that the, uh, that the world is in the grips of a global pandemic, then we don't have much to talk about. How do we collectively argue logic and reason with folks who are illogical or unreasonable? I don't know. Logic says that when we learn new facts and new information, we should change our position and understanding. I'm very open to constantly learning and I seek to understand and learn from all the participants here tonight. This brings me back to my two commonalities, science and empathy. When we understand science, we understand the method of transmission for COVID-19 and so we isolate, go for tests, wash our hands, keep our distance, wear masks. And because we have empathy, we care about our fellow humans on the planet and we wish them no harm. So we isolate, go for tests, wash our hands, keep our distance, wear the masks. When we understand science of how vaccines work to present disease, prevent disease and save lives, we support immunologists, chemists, and medical researchers to make a vaccine. Because we have empathy, we wanna protect the people we love from dying and suffering. And so we make sure that they will have access, access to a future vaccine. The great thing about empathy is that it can be a part of all religions but we don't need to be religious to have empathy. The same for all moral morality. One can be moral without religion. One can be an atheist and be moral or 
be an atheist and be immoral. One can be religious and moral and one can be religious and immoral. Morality like empathy is a construct that exists outside of atheism or theism or deism. The issue that perplexes me and some of my fellow atheists is the denial of science and facts. We can be entitled to our own opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. Across religious communities, I'm interested to hear what others say about what God's role is in COVID-19. There are generally four options. God is A, unaware that it's happening, B, aware but unable to stop it, C, aware but unwilling to stop it, D, deliberately causing it. Since I find no scientific evidence for God's, I have E, no opinion of this. I do, however, have empathy with those that are trying to figure out things in these trying and challenging times. As well as we all do, we have empathy for those who are ill and dying as a result of the virus and the subsequent pain suffering as a result of isolation and economic pressures and mental stress. As an atheist, of course, I don't believe in God, but I understand that others have a need to pray and prayer gives solace and comfort. I have empathy for people who wish things to be different. I wish that things were different also. I don't believe that a miracle will save us. I, however, empathize with others wishing for things to change. I believe in the power that exists when humans come together and help other, to help others, other humans heal. In short, my position is that the established medical community will heal us. They rely on the years of education and practical application of their knowledge. Uh, if others of us choose to believe that this is facilitated by a supernatural power, that's not important to me, as long as everyone has access to that medical help when they need it. And I believe that our family structures can support and heal the deepest and most egregious wounds. I don't believe that there's evidence that faith healing works. I find it challenging to have empathy for parents who use faith healing instead of medical healing. If we have COVID symptoms, don't we generally believe we should go to a hospital, not a house of worship? I am an imperfect non-believer trying to use logic and reason to figure things out. I do believe that we're all trying to figure things out. We're all on a quest for knowledge and wisdom. We're all trying to do the best we can in trying circumstances with compassion. If I see some of us treating others without compassion, I'm vexed, I'm stymied. I'm very open to learning about how to communicate with other primates that reside on our beautiful blue globe. However, if your religion says we aren't on a globe, but the earth is flat, I find this problematic. Along with others who believe that the world is 6,000 years old instead of 4.54 billion years plus or minus 15 million years. I find this challenging, but for the most part, most atheists really don't care what we choose to believe as long as the separation of church and state is maintained. A pretty unifying stance of atheists are that we want a strong division of religion and science, religion and public education, religion and politics. Really the only time you'll hear atheists say build that wall is the wall between church and state. When people find out I'm an atheist, their first response is usually, usually an incredulous, you don't believe in God? They are in disbelief about my atheism and I am doubtful about a lot of things. So skepticism brings us together. And really it's not that I don't believe in any gods, I just don't find any evidence for them. At last count in humankind's history, we've invented 2,996 gods. Most of us don't believe 2,995 of them. I just disbelieve one more than you do. So really we're closer than you think. When we realize that we're all in this together and our common enemy is the virus, we can all win. When we recognize the weapons we wield to defeat the virus, our sympathy and empathy, we can all win. I'll end with a quote. One day, a student asked anthropo anthropologist uh, Margaret Mead, what was the first sign of civilization in a given culture? The student expected Mead to tell him about a hook, a pottery, or a grindstone. But Mead replied that the first sign of civilization in ancient culture was a thigh bone that had been broken and then healed. She explained that in the animal kingdom, when an individual breaks its leg, it dies. It can no longer escape danger, neither go to the river to drink water nor seek food. It becomes an easy prey for the beasts on alert. No animal can survive a broken leg. The time that it takes to, till the bone is tied again. The healed thigh bone is the proof that someone spent time with the patient, tied his wound, transported him to a safe place and helped him. 
Margaret Mead said that the starting point of a civilization was the help to someone in difficulty, the first sign of solidarity. That's the end of the quote. So I see this as empathy. I may not believe in a God, but I believe that science and empathy can be used to promote peace and mutual coexistence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, this primate definitely uh, enjoyed your thought-provoking presentation. Um, so up next, um, actually, I should just remind everybody, um, if you have any questions or comments on the speakers or any portion of this uh, presentation, uh, please uh, text your questions and comments to 587-200-5359. Again, 587-200-5359 and we'll take up questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So up next, we've got a message from Chief Lee Crowfield of the Sutina Nation. Uh, Chief Lee Crowchild led the Sutina Nation from 2017 through 2019. Uh, Chief Crowchild is a friend of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat. He has participated in many of our programs, including the annual Convention of Western Canada for 2019, uh, which was held at the Sutina First Nations Sportplex. Uh, let us listen to a message from Chief Lee Crowfield, uh, Crowchild now. I am Chief Lee Crowchild of Sutuna. I was asked to make comment on our realities. We all know what the pandemic is about, and we all reacted accordingly. We called the first wave. The first wave was about fear, fear about the what is and the unknowns. And people talk of the second wave. Well, what is the second wave? The second wave isn't about fear. The second wave is actually about love. True, we might get a rise in cases of coronavirus, but that's just a repeat of the first wave. We move towards creating the second wave. The second wave that moves towards love. And you can see it happening social justice is coming about, social unrest, change. And it might seem ugly at first, but it's necessary. When we pray to whoever we call God, Allah, Creator, Issa, as we would, or Nata, we all ask for to make things better. And the world listened, our Mother Earth listened. It says, okay, you want change? I'll make some change. This is what it's going to look like. So we have to remind ourselves that we did pray for change. We didn't know what the change would look like. Now it's come. As we move forward, it's more important than ever to open these dialogues and not close them. Canada is a cultural mosaic of many nations, many new immigration that's come to here. So it's much more important that we carry on a call to action, a call to make things better, because we all have to share this land. We as First Nations, we are the stewards of this land, and it is our responsibility. No matter what happens, we belong to this land, and we act in such a way. So I invite you all to continue this dialogue this dialogue of sharing, of getting to know one another, of creating better understanding. I look forward to having more dialogue with any and all of you. And I look forward to when we can come together as brothers and sisters once again and share meals and share love. After all, we have to do this for the seven generations that are coming after us. Siaskas, thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Crowchild. Um, up next, we're gonna hear from somebody representing Hinduism, um, Pankaj Dulabai, a professional engineer who immigrated to Canada in 1984. He and his wife, uh, Shredda, have two children, a son and a daughter, they're both married. Pankaj is interested in reading, traveling, photography, and software development. He's part of the Swade Parivar, a spiritual and cultural organization registered in several countries in the world, including the USA and Canada. I I'd like to welcome Pankaj. 
Thank you. Um, before I begin, I would like to say a prayer, but I also would just like to mention that, yes, I do belong to the Swadhyay Parivar, but I'm in no way representing the Swadhyay Parivar today. Whatever I'm going to say is my own understanding of the work that they do. Okay. Vasudeva Sutan Devam Kamsa Chano Ramardhanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishna Vande Jagat Guru says, O the son of Vasudeva, you are the Lord who destroyed the demons, Kamsa and Charnul. You give the ultimate joy to Mother Devaki and we bow to you, Krishna, as the Lord of the universe. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Parabrahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama. Guru is the representative of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. He creates and sustains knowledge. He destroys the weeds of ignorance. I salute and bow to such a guru. Um, I'd like to share the screen now. Okay, so today's topic is uh, quite complex and vast. It's especially hard for me because I'm neither a scholar in religion or any other aspects, and I'm also not an expert. Uh, I don't know anything about or not, not much about pandemics, so I'm not, I can't really talk about it. Um, I do study religion through the listening to commentaries and, and reading the discourses and from my masters. And I, I'm grateful to them to teach me whatever I could grasp from their teachings. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is due to the river Anurang Shastri Arhavale, uh, who founded the Swadhyaya Parivar. We also address him as Puja Dadaji, and you'll hear that in my talk today. Uh, as I said, all the information included in this presentation regarding Swadhyaya is as per only my understanding, and it's not, not from Swadhyaya. And of course, if I make mistakes, then the fault is mine. Uh, So we are talking about making peace. And peace to me means peace of mind. It's happiness all around. Everybody's mind has, is at ease, at peace. There are no conflicts because conflicts lead to the breaking of peace or shattering of peace. And there are a number of reasons and uh, causes for conflicts in this world. And I've listed some of these over here. But the important thing is that conflicts have been around with us for uh, centuries now. Um, for thousands of years, religion was able to bring stability to uh, the human life. And that's because religions, they teach us how to live our life, how to deal with other people and the society in general. Um, but the influence of the religion has been diminished and is diminishing. And in my opinion, it's more because of the technology and the science and the advancements there. And uh, these things are good. I am an engineer myself. It has made, those things have made our life easy. Uh, there are no repetitive tasks. And nowadays, of course, we get to play with all the wonderful toys that technology uh, uh, produces. So obviously people are more drawn towards these things these days rather than towards religion or any of the other things. And uh, to this, uh, I think some of the people may even consider religion as old fashioned or anti-progress. Now, as I said, um, um, I'm not an expert in pandemics, 
but pandemics or no pandemics or there is really no good time or a bad time or right time or wrong time to think about um, making peace. In other words, how do we um, resolve conflicts, remove or re reduce conflicts? And that's what I'm going to talk about more than about pandemics and its immediate effects. Um, we have tried through uh, different types of governance, all these isms like socialism and communism and things like that to reduce and remove conflicts or to create a society where there are the conflicts are minimum or minimal. But um, I must say that the, the I have succeeded maybe, but success has been short-lived. And what we are looking for actually is a more permanent solution. And in, I think that most of the attempts at, at resolutions of conflicts, uh, the privileged ones, uh, the two sides of the conflicts, the privileged and the, un, um, the underprivileged or the disadvantaged ones, the privileged ones have to either give up or share uh, some of their privileges or whatever they have earned through great effort. And usually people don't like to do that. Um, and so we need to be looking at something else. And in my opinion, this is again my opinion, I think we can bring the two sides together if we can create a situation where the privileged really don't have to give up anything or share anything unless they really want to, or the situation should be such, the environment should be such that they really feel like sharing whatever they have. And at the same time, those, they, this, we have to empower the disadvantaged ones because they, we don't want them to feel that uh, we are doing it because we have pity for them or that they should be obligated and do something else for us. So how can we do that? This looks like or sounds like an impossible task. Um, Pujadaraji was born and raised in a family of Vedic scholars and teachers. And uh, he was himself a scholar. Uh, and he has given lots of uh, uh, lectures and but since his childhood, he was always troubled by inequality, social divisions, untouchability, and things like that around him. And he always wanted to um, get rid of these things or you know, bring, resolve conflicts. And he was a, a student of philosophy. Of course, the Vedic philosophy was his main subject, but he also studied Western philosophy. And so in his search for a solution to uh, these issues that he was seeing around him, he came up with a model, which is the family. The biological family that we see today is one example of that, or the starting point for that. So in a family, we have parents and the kids. Parents love the kids and they also nurture them. And they, but they bring up the, the children in an environment that promotes unity, harmony, respect for others, trust, and willingness to help them out. They're, they're, they're brothers and sisters, love and of course sacrifice. And so a, a family has everything, almost everything, that we are looking for in this world to bring down the, the amount, the number of conflicts that we may be facing at any time. So if, if we have these biological families with all the, the requisite uh, qualities, can we think of a bigger family, which consists of a, a number of these individual families? And then, can we transcend all these good qualities that I just talked about, that if each family is supposed to have, and they do generally have, can those qualities transcend these boundaries of individual families? And then we come up with one big family where 
or which inherits all these good qualities that, that we are talking about. So in, in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Lord says, uh, I reside in every heart. And he also says that I am the one who digests the food that you eat. This is a very powerful message. In a sense, what he's saying is that the, the God or the Lord, the um, supreme power, the creator of this whole universe is within me. And he's just not within me, but he's active. Because he says he digests the food, which means that when a food is digested, it generates energy, which means that he's sustaining me. He's actually running my life. And so this is a very empowering um, thought when it is understood properly and when it sinks in. Because if the, if the creator is with me, I can do whatever I want because he helps me in everything. And I do ask some, I do ask in the beginning, why I'm such a small man, I'm one of the billions, and why is the creator, the supreme power, interested in me, in running my life? And then somebody like Dadaji will come along and say, that is because you are his creation. You are his child. And so, he bec and so God is my father. And so that is very similar to what we have that in a family, you have the father and the child. So this is the understanding that we get, at least I get and I think others also get from what Lord is saying in this particular uh, chapter. And I also, and, and, and so once we understand this deeply, we have love for the God, and we also have this gratitude, a feeling of gratitude that he's doing so much for me that I should do something for him too. And that's where the God's work also come into picture. And then again, someone like Dadaji comes along and he says, but just as God is running your life, he's also running the life of the other people. And there's only one God. And so instantly we created a relationship with all the 6 billion people because now this relationship is not biological, but it's a divine relationship. Again, we have the unifying factor of God, the father, and we are all the children of the same God. And so we are all brothers and sisters, divine brothers and sisters, and Dadaji called it the brotherhood under the fatherhood of God. And now we have, in, in theory right now, created an extensive, an extended divine family that we were looking for. And so when this understanding is really ingrained in all the families that make up this, make up this family of families, then uh, all those good things that we talked about, they transcend these individual boundaries between the families. Still the families, individual families, they operate independently. They go about doing their own work, but there is a, a, a bigger family of which they are part. So is this thing possible? Is this practical thing? Or is it just a dream? And I'm glad to say that, no, Dadaji implemented this model in thousands of villages in India where great transformations have taken place. I have personally visited some of these villages. And if you talk to those people there, they will say that what you see today and what you would have seen 15 years back will be two different pictures. Today you see selfless love and respect and devotion and, and all those things, but 15 years back, there was hatred and violence and gambling and alcoholism and all. But with the, these th thoughts coming in to these Swadhyay families, things have changed. It generally takes 15, 20 years for a majority of the families in a village to adopt this. And 
it becomes a bigger village, a bigger family. And it's not just one family. They had issues with other surrounding villages also. And even there, the same things are spreading and they also become part of this bigger family. People do not ex are, are so self-reliant, self-respecting. They don't accept any handouts anymore. And just like everywhere else, the politicians, they visit them every four years, election time. They want to buy their votes. But these villages that we are talking about, they say, we don't need you. Our vote is not for sale. And we'll, we know what we want and we'll do whatever we think is the right thing to do. Mm. Now, all these things have happened in about 40 years of time. And it still continues today. And as Dadaji says, a lot of work to be yet to be done. He actually, he started the, the work in the mid fifties in Mumbai with just 18 people, 18 interested youths who said, yeah, let, give us more information about it. Tell us more about it. And then Dadaji, he, he sort of groomed them. And then he started the actual work later on. But today, the Swadhyay family or the Parivar, which is based on the same model, is tens of millions strong, and we have presence in 34 countries. Tarazi always says that the principles that were used in this work have universal application. But each community or each group of people or each nation can adopt these to in accordance with their cultural beliefs and systems, and they can start creating their own divine families. And maybe in our, uh, you know, we can all combine our, later on, all our divine families to create one big global divine families, which probably will answer our questions or our quest for an end to um, conflicts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pankaj. That was uh, really well prepared and well researched, and really we we could have gone all night. There, there's so much there. I think. Um, all right. Uh, just a reminder to the audience: um, if you have any questions or comments, the phone number for text is five eight seven two zero zero five three five nine. Uh, up next, we've got a short message from Heather Kohlberg, the mayor of Drumheller. Uh, Drumheller has been a regular venue of the World Religions Conference. Um, and our friend, Mayor Kohlberg uh, of the beautiful town of Drumheller has sent us the following message. So let us listen to what she's got to say. Hi everyone, my name is Heather Kohlberg and I am the mayor of the town of Drumheller. I stand with the hoodoos behind me and it's an incredible place that so many from people from around the world come to visit. It brings people from everywhere, all different cultures, to enjoy such an incredible place. And this is the same as religion. We all have our own choices, we all have our own beliefs, but at the end of the day we need to respect each other. We need to understand that we are all different and that's the wonderful part of this amazing world that we live in. So I hope you all enjoy your day. Thank you for asking me to send greetings. I love my valley. I have the best job in the world. And please come and visit us. Take care of yourselves. Thank you, Mayor Kohlberg. I, I love Drumheller too. It's a great city. Um, all right, up next we have, um, uh, who do we have? We have Kamar Ahmed uh, speaking on behalf of Run for Calgary. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat organizes uh, various community service events throughout the year. Run for Calgary is one such event. And I'd like to invite Kamar Mirza to share more details of this year's run. Thank you, Dan. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all watching from home. The 2020 Run for Calgary in support of the Canadian Blood Services will be held virtually on September 27, 2020 at 11 a.m. The Run for Calgary is an annual event that was created and organized by the Amdiya Muslim Youth Association for the sole purpose of providing a grassroots program to raise funds and awareness for non-for-profit and other social organizations in Calgary. The Run big, brings together runners, walkers, cyclers of all skill levels from across Calgary. 
The first run was held in 2010 and has become an annual event. The run raised $25,000 for the Genesis Center, $150,000 for the Alberta Children's Hospital, and over the past two years has been working closely with the Canadian Blood Services. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as many of our speakers have touched upon, this runs a little different this year. Individuals, groups, and families can register online and submit their times through a virtual app. This app is fully integrated with our system and it allows for all of our individuals to track their time. Last day to submit your time is one day before the run on Saturday, September 26th at 12 p.m. If you're not running, you can still participate by donating to support the Canadian Blood Services and you can join us on Sunday, September 27th at 11 a.m. for a virtual one hour event where we will be showing live streams of individuals running all across Calgary or biking or walking. Again, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Association has been supporting the Canadian Blood Services and this event for the past 10 years. And this year we, join, we encourage you to join us again. And our website is available below. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, that, uh, what a great, that, that's awesome. <laughs> um, all right, um, up next, we've got a message from Dr. Peter Ninoda, uh, the president of Red Deer College. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat and Red Deer College have been partners for nearly two decades. Red Deer College is the host of the largest annual World Religions Conference in Western Canada. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, our president, uh, Dr. P Peter Ninoda. <laughs> I'm Dr. Peter Ninota, and I'm here to bring greetings on behalf of Red Deer College to the annual World Religion Conference. RDC is a proud partner with the Amadea Muslim community in Calgary in presenting uh, this annual event. The theme of this year's conference is the global pandemic, an opportunity to make peace. And I think that this is especially timely for us at Red Deer College, as we have weathered the storm of the pandemic uh, admirably well. But what impresses me most is that our college community, faculty, staff, administrators and students have come together, regardless of their faith backgrounds, to make for a great learning experience in a very challenging time. I believe that our example here at Red Deer College is one uh, that can uh, set a, a stage, uh, an example uh, for global peace, where we ignore our faith-based differences and we work towards the common cause of bettering the world through peace for humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so up ne next, I'd like to invite our next speaker representing Christianity, uh, David Benjamin. David Benjamin emigrated from India as a student. He married and settled in Alberta, and he has primarily served bivocationally in retail management and Christ Christian pastoral roles. He was a bachelor of science student at St. Stephen's College in New Delhi when the opportunity arose to study overseas. He now holds a master's in global leadership from Fuller Theological Seminary from California, USA. Uh, so welcome, David. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, especially uh, respected uh, Brother Bashir and Brother Malik. And uh, we, um, I want to take this opportunity to recognize also uh, Pastor Ashwin Dramani from Center Street Church. And uh, so uh, with whose help I'm able to join this panel this year, and it's a great privilege for me. And so a little bit about me um, is uh, that I've had the opportunity um, to, to learn um, both as a student, as well as uh, the opportunity to, to work both in the, in the secular field, as well as in the pastoral realm. And so my association with Center Street Church comes from that which is a part of what is called the Evangelical Missionary Church of Canada. And I currently pastor uh, at uh, Yeshu Mandi, a congregation here in Calgary. And as we think of um, the, the synopsis that was offered by Brother Malik in the email that I received, 
about the current situation, uh, as he described, and, and I have added to it a little bit, that the world is shaken, countries brought to standstill, fallibility and frailty of individuals, organizations, and have been exposed, and, and I've elaborated on them, that that includes religious, business, government, uh, and systems and environment as well as we recognize uh, these days. And so the question uh, uh, that is before us that how can our leaders, uh, faith and uh, agnostics help foster a spirit of mutual cooperation to bring peace and stability in our communities? And so specifically, as I uh, look at this question, um, how do the Christian scriptures guide me in defining and realizing peace and stability contextually, and I use the word contextually because as uh, I was introduced that I was born in India and I came here uh, earlier on as a student. And so, so I've become aware that even as we talk uh, through the lenses of religion or, or our faith system, that those are also specific to the context where we might have been exposed to that and uh, which might be close to our value system. And so as we look at um, the Christian scriptures, uh, we understand that God is the origin of peace and he's the initiator of peacemaking. And he offers peace of mind that shields our hearts and minds through the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we can only offer what we already have. And so uh, as we think of, of even the greeting that we use in many contexts, and that is shalom or salam or other variances of that, that it refers both to the external or the community as well as internal and what is inside of us. And so in the Holy Scriptures, in Philippians chapter two, uh, chapter four, excuse me, from two to eight, the Apostle Paul is offering us um, what I would call a case study. And so I would bring that up on the screen for you, where he says, I entreat Eotia, I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I would submit that the uh, the underlying areas are areas of emphasis for me as I was trying to disseminate what is being said in this. And they're not part of the ocean scriptures, and I should have the reference that that this comes from Philippians chapter four, verses two to eight. So as we look at this case study in this passage, it seems to be very intense and maybe even emotionally charged disagreement between two people in a community in the city of Philippi. And the Apostle Paul is writing a letter and requesting others to help these two people resolve this issue. He identifies certain attitudes and traits that would usher in the peace of God. He says things like rejoice. Another word is be joyful, be reasonable, do not be anxious. Be prayerful, in other words, depend upon God in this whole process of intervention and bringing reconciliation. Peace is absolutely threatened, as we have all said, at times of uncertainty, and there can be rhetoric and arrows of conflict flying in every possible direction. Some people might deny that there is conflict, run away from conflict, or simply shift the blame and refuse to take any ownership of the problem. Others might put up a fight, put down the other side, and go into offensive at the threat of conflict. And so peacekeepers attempt to avoid conflict by excuse me, keeping people apart. But peacemakers 
look for ways to resolve the reasons for the conflict and bring people together. And the Lord Jesus Christ gave a call for peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And so as we try to understand this, and how do we uh, resolve, how, how do we bring about a peace? Um, in the scriptures, again, if I may uh, share that with you, is um, looks like my screen is going back. Here we go. Uh, what are the opportunities that exist in our local context? And again, as I said, I'm very aware that contexts are really important in this, uh, to work together for peace and reconciliation. So again, the Holy Scriptures, 1 Peter 4, it suggests that there are times when we need to overlook certain things. It says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. In other words, understand, and this is my interpretation, understand and teach on what is important and not to make mountains of molehills. Another passage from Matthew that is important to talk and communicate that if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. So communication, understanding how people communicate and how they receive communication so important. Another passage talks about getting help in the same place in verse 17, that if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. In other words, my interpretation of that is that it takes a community to keep peace in the community. So it's not the job description of certain people with set roles in society. We need to know how things can escalate and flags should alert us when, on how far they could escalate and appropriate and timely response is important. In 1 Peter 3, 11 says, seek peace and pursue it. Run after that, it is important. And so number one, I believe that we as leaders can model and promote humility in our communication and posture we should be perceived as being on the same side of our brother and sister relationally with whom we may not agree on something philosophically. And here language and the appropriate use of language is so important. And the other thing is to discover, help discover each other's strengths, celebrate our strengths, share our diversity for the benefit of all. And I think uh, media, sports, music, and arts are such tools to discover each other's strengths. And if I may add, even food. And then we need to identify sources and hotspots in our areas of influence and responsibility that could result in greater conflict and offer help and support and teaching rather than minimizing or ignoring them. So where are the areas in our system of family work and community life that need to be reassessed for systemic negative outcomes and behaviors. And then how can we resource ordinary Canadians and newcomers to Canada to be positive, but extraordinary difference makers in multifaceted families, multifaceted and international companies and businesses through social enterprise and community engagement. This calls for time management where we spend sufficient time in our health and growth. Secondly, in time spent with those that we have immediate responsibility, like our spouse, our children, place of employment, etc. But not to minimize that, finally, the community at large, both physically and virtually. Religious systems can be both involuntary instigators, but also unduly blamed for systemic outcomes. Therefore, fear, suspicion, and retaliation are the result either way. The individual experiences of those who have traveled or lived in diverse societies can precondition certain unintentional responses and reactions. People, for example, can work side by side at a grocery store, at a factory, or on an engineering project, but be worlds apart in how they are profiled by Facebook and other social media news feeds. 
So fear and anxiety can stifle our ability and motivation to work with each other. Humor and comedy are a great medicine where we start to see the lighter side of life, take ourselves less seriously, and then be energized to take real challenges seriously and passionately. The Apostle Paul says that as we work hard in the right posture and with the right tools, that we are all invited to experience the peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ that will guard our hearts and minds. Sin and the devil are ultimately the reason for conflict internally and communities. Jesus' death on the cross made the way for is restoring us to God our Father and defeat Satan and to make peace with God and remove fear and anxiety from our hearts and minds. Finally, my brothers and sisters, we work for God's approval. Our engagement may not make the news or TV or radio. We may not see immediate results and people may not respond as we might expect or have certain expectations of us. At the end of the day, we need to remember that we can do our best with the knowledge and wisdom that God offers us and leave the rest in the hands of a good God and Father of all mankind. Thank you so much. Thank you, David, for a very informative presentation. Uh, we had a great comment come in in the middle of your in the middle of your speech. I thought you might want to hear. Uh, they said, um, "This is a beautiful concept. We are all one big family because God resides in us all and unites us inside. Selfless love and respect really can transform." Absolutely, and I'm wondering if that may be referring to uh, Brother Pankaj, who had talked about the growth of the family concept. And uh, so I, I would defer that to uh, Brother Pankaj, if he would like to add to that. Yeah, I, I think I, I understood that, that was supposed to be for me. But I mean, is that just a comment? Is there a question? No, there's no, no question. We've still got another speaker. Uh, it was just a comment that came in during. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I agree fully agree with that. And hopefully, uh, yeah. So thanks for the comment. <laughs> so, sorry for derailing no, us. No um, it was great presentation, both of you. <laughs> okay, our, our final speaker of the night, uh, representing Islam, is Imam Asif Arif. Imam Asif is currently serving the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat in Calgary. Asif was raised in Calgary and he completed all his schooling in Calgary. After graduating from high school, he, he dedicated his life and sought admission in the Ahmadiyya Muslim Missionaries Training College in Toronto. After completing the seven-year course, he, was, he had the opportunity to serve in the Fiji Islands from 2014 through 2018, and he is now rendering his services in Calgary. He is married and he has two children. Uh, welcome, Asif. Thank you, Dan. Um, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the gracious, ever merciful. To my distinguished panelists and the viewers watching this program at home, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings, and the mercy of Allah be upon you all. Owing to the coronavirus pandemic, everyone in the world is anxious. The reality of the matter is that nothing can be understood of what is happening to the world. But the Holy Quran speaks of the conditions of the time in which we live. The Holy Quran states, وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا And man says, what is the matter with her? Chapter 99, verse 4. Details of Quranic teachings and those of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, about pandemics and illnesses have been highlighted on several occasions by His Holiness Mirza Masrur Ahmad, the Caliph and worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Now my religion Islam presents a complete code of life 
and it guides me at every junction of life and teaches me to live a balanced life. For example, the importance of good hygiene has been stressed in the Holy Quran. We read in chapter 2, verse 223, Indeed, Allah loves those who turn to him repenting, and he loves those who keep themselves clean and pure. Over 1400 years ago, the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, advised quarantine, and he spoke of social distancing, saying, do not place a sick patient with a healthy person. Even the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, during the plague outbreak in India, advised his Jamaat members to take precautionary measures. He said that along with prayer, also utilize the practical means and resources that are available. In other words, fully and comprehensively adopt all precautionary measures. All these highlighted teachings of Islam tie in with the fundamental teaching of Islam that we are all obligated to fill the rights of God as well as the rights of our fellow human beings. When we adhere to the precautionary measures highlighted by local authorities, we do so in an effort to fulfill each other's rights to ensure peace throughout the society and the world at large. We are currently experiencing a global pandemic. But what has become all too apparent is how godlessness is on the rise. This precarious situation should be a cause for us to turn to our creator with a greater zeal and passion and fulfill his rights by worshiping him wholeheartedly. We are also witnessing how relations on all levels of society have become strained. We see an utter lack of unity among nations and tensions are on the rise. A sense of anxiety rests in the hearts of everyone as to what the future may hold. Divisions are growing deeper. There is a lack of justice and peace seems to be a distant reality. The reality of the matter is that we yearn for justice at every level, at every level of society, from the grassroots all the way up to the international stage. We have to realize that peace and justice are inseparable. You cannot have one without the other. Certainly, this principle is something that all wise and intelligent people understand. We should all remember that human knowledge is not perfect. And at times, our decisions lead to unjust outcomes. God's law, however, is perfect. His law is based entirely on justice. The day the people of the world come to recognize and understand this crucial point will be the day that the foundation for true and everlasting peace will be laid. Now, what does Islam say in relation to international relations that are based on justice and so a means of establishing peace? In the Holy Quran, God Almighty has made it clear that whilst our nationalities or ethnic backgrounds act as a mean of, means of identity, they do not entitle or validate any form of superiority of any kind. Islam teaches absolute justice and equality in all matters. And so we find another very crucial guideline in chapter 5, verse 3 of the Holy Quran. In this verse, it states that to fully comply with the requirements of justice, it is necessary to treat even those people who go beyond all limits in their hatred and enmity with fairness and equity. The Quran teaches that wherever and whosoever counsels you towards goodness and virtue, you should accept it. And wherever and whoever counsels you towards sinful or unjust behavior, you should reject it. 
Another beautiful teaching of peace presented by the Holy Quran is, and good and evil are not alike. Repel evil with that which is best. And lo, he between whom and yourself was enmity will become as though he were a warm friend. Thus the Quran teaches that as far as possible, any enmities or grudges should be reconciled and solved by opening the channels of communication and through dialogue. The world has become a global village, and so a lack of mutual respect and a failure to join or promote peace will result in devastating consequences. Islam has drawn our attention to various means for peace. It requires truthful testimony to always be given. It requires that our glances are not cast enviously in the, in the direction of the wealth of others. It requires that the developed nations put aside their vested interests and instead help and serve the less developed and poorer nations with a truly selfless attitude and spirit. If all these factors are observed, then true peace will be established. If during this pandemic, we are truly in this together, then we have to adhere to these principles of absolute justice to ensure peace at all levels of society. During this pandemic, we need to unite and not continue to grow deeper divisions. It is for this reason that the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat emphasizes to all people the critical need of fulfilling the rights of God of, and of his creation and of establishing the very best standards of justice. I conclude my thoughts with the words of His Holiness Mirza Masur Ahmad. Regrettably, the sad truth remains that instead of elevating our standards of love and compassion, the opposite is proving true. Selfishness, greed, and a culture of me is prevailing across the world and across society. Thus, I pray with all my heart that mankind forsakes greed and forgoes the pursuit of narrow self-interests and, in, and instead comes to recognize the importance of protecting all of humanity and of showing kindness, compassion, and love for God's creation. I pray that a spirit of service to humanity takes permanent root in society so that we protect our future and leave behind a better world for our children and coming generations to live in. May God the Almighty enable all of us to fulfill our, responsibility, our responsibilities in this regard. With these words, I would like to once again thank all of our viewers for joining us today's, in today's virtual event. May God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you, Imam, Imam Asif. Um, so that concludes our presentations part of the evening. Uh, up next, we're gonna have about 15 minutes of questions and answers. Um, if you haven't already, please text your comments and questions to 587-200-5359. Now, I, I just like to remind our panelists that because we're uh, virtual and we're, you know, we're, we're you know, virtually chat chatting, I'm going to ask questions and I'm going to call on each of you individually to answer because if we all just jump in, it's going to be all of us yelling at each other and that'll just be chaos. <laughs> so uh, for our, our first question of the night is for everybody. Um, how has COVID-19 changed your life? How have you addressed that change? And then is there a piece of advice that you would um, be willing to share with the audience to bring peace into our lives um, during this time? So let's start with um, Caroline. Caroline. Thanks, Dan. Uh, how has COVID changed my life? Well, um, uh, I'm a professional uh, playwright and uh, theatre critic, so I am uh, ostensibly completely out of work. <laughs> and uh, my whole community, my immediate tribe, are all uh, suffering very badly and, and really wondering about what the future holds for us as we, we can't assemble to, to have the... Uh, the, uh, to see the art that we need to create and that people need to see. And um, David mentioned uh, 
humor as being part of the, the pathway of working through this. And I truly believe that humor and entertainment uh, can, can be very healing and can be a very uh, positive thing for all of us. And uh, I think that not only the theater creators missing out, but also the audiences are, are missing out. Um, and then on another level, uh, I have a lot of concern. Um, the CFI, Center for Inquiry, we're sponsoring a, a refugee who's been uh, persecuted and has refugee status, and we cannot bring that person immediately into Canada uh, because of COVID. And so we've had to mobilize to send extra funds to this person. We're very worried about this person. And uh, um, I, I, I worry about him a lot. So uh, everybody else in my family is good, but uh, this refugee I've yet to meet is, is in my heart a lot. Uh, Ankash. Yeah, how my life has changed. It has changed quite a bit, like everybody else. Uh, to start with, uh, I'm home most of the time. Nowhere to go except for walks in the evening with my wife. Um, so trying to be keep healthy is something that uh, I'm learning. And... Also, of course, working from home is a novel experience. First, I thought it would be good, but then, uh, like, and I talked to so many people and people say that, what is this COVID? What's the worst thing that COVID has done? And the answer I get most of the times is, oh, I can't meet my friends. I can't meet my family. I can't meet my relatives. So being in touch, with other people, if we can't do it personally, or phoning, or just you know standing out on the street, keeping the safe distance, talking with people, those are the things that I think are important, and those are the things that we are trying to do. So totally agree, uh, David. I appreciate uh, the comment about the first and second wave of fear, and then I think followed by love. Um, uh, I'm not a social media person, but uh, Zoom has been excellent. I was able to get my family together because my family is in different parts of the world. In fact, one of my aunts who last time she saw me, she said, you were 12 years old. I won't tell you what my age is right now, but it's a few years ago. So it's been, an, uh, uh, yes, there has been a grieving of loss of connections but uh, technology has uh, made it possible to rediscover connections, the time to go back and uh, rediscover friends that we had lost contact with. And so, so there's that bit of uh, celebration on my part that I'm enjoying. The only part I don't enjoy uh, or is a shock when you go out to the grocery store and realize people are not in small boxes in two dimension, <laughs> but they are real and live and and uh, with all those things, you get, start watching Zoom uh, or on Zoom meeting for too long, you forget that. So thank you. Um, awesome. So um, I think for all of us, uh, it has enabled us to uh, use technology to, for our advantage. Uh, and that's a pretty significant change uh, that has been brought by COVID-19. Uh, in all of our lives. Um, Islam teaches us a, a balanced approach to life. And uh, the, the thing that COVID-19 has taught us all is the fragility of life and how fragile we are as human beings. And uh, we always need to uh, rely on the divine and that is our creator, God. And so the message that I would give to all the viewers at home is that we have to, in the small amount of life that we have, fulfill the rights of God, recognize him, and fulfill each other's rights to ensure a peaceful society. Thank you. Um, okay, so next question. This is for everybody again, but it's directed at Caroline in particular. Um, 
So Caroline, you said prayer gives solace and comfort. Um, who do you turn to for solace and comfort at this moment of turmoil? Who do I turn to for solace and comfort? Uh, well, uh, my communities. Um, I belong to several communities, so political communities, uh, social, family, um, the people that I'm working in concert with to do, to do good things in the world, uh, where we can uh, support each other and, um, and help each other and encourage each other and love each other. Uh, and so that's, um, that's a big part of it. I'm, I'm also a big reader as well. So I, I read a lot. I read a lot about, uh, you know, philosophy and different types of thinking. And so I get inspiration everywhere from Shakespeare to Sam Harris to, <laughs> you know, uh, so it's, it's, yeah, that's about it. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I've been reading a great book, uh, Seven Types of Atheism during, during the uh, quarantine here. I highly recommend it. Um, Pankaj, um, who do you turn to for uh, solace and comfort during these times? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> we, we turn to each other first, our family, our friends. Um, and then we also turn to God. Um, we do, I mean, it's part of our regular life, but now there's a more awareness about, you know, how the situation that we are in and seeking some guidance. Uh, and also we've got a number of books that we read, again, philosophical or religious related. That gives us solace too. Uh, we have got lots of time, as I said, we have nowhere to go. And the number of books and pages that I've read in the last six months is probably more than what I've done in my whole life. So uh, that's probably, these are the two or three things that we do. And it, it does help, it does help us. Uh, David? Um, I am a musician of sorts. I, I love uh, nothing uh, else but to have the time with my guitar or something like that and just to, to enjoy uh, tones and harmonies and, and all that. And, and these days of pandemic have allowed some of us, if we live in Calgary, to actually enjoy the beautiful outdoors uh, but as uh, one of the scriptures here from my uh, esteemed brother, um, uh, I may not be quoting it correctly, but lead us from the known to the unknown. And, and I think um, we don't see God, but I think God is revealed uh, in many ways around us through books, through wisdom of others. Um, but it uh, leads us back to him. And so that is where my compass points uh, ultimately through, especially through music. And awesome. Thank you for that uh, very important question. You know, the Quran says, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatmainul qulub. Verily, it is in the remembrance of God that hearts find comfort. And so, uh, where I find my solace and peace is uh, in the ability uh, for me to, you know, pray five times a day. Uh, I turn to my God in uh, difficult situations, and uh, uh, that is what I will continue to do. Sorry. Um, okay. Next question is for everybody here again. Um, they're wondering what, um, what each faith's perspective is on COVID and if it's a signaling an, of an end of days. Uh, let's, I guess, start. We'll, we'll just go the same way. Uh, Caroline. I don't think it's applicable. <laughs> we, we, we don't think there's an end of, of days. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the election in the South, but... And there's a lot of forest fires, and I think there's a a, a lot of uh, climate change denial. But um, I I don't I don't believe in an end of days. Um, Pankaj, could you please repeat the question? Um, what is your faith's perspective on COVID, and uh, is it signaling the end of days or an end of days? 
Um, COVID, uh, the faith, the perspective of the faith on COVID. I, well, the only thing that uh, I can think of, I'm not an expert, as I said, is that COVID and, and certain these, these kind of uh, natural forces, to me, they are the messages from God that you are not invincible. You may be a privileged person, but natural forces are great levelers. And so we may spend our life and time in pursuit of things that probably don't really matter much in the end. And so listen to that message and then maybe try to change our lives. Fair enough. Uh, David. Uh, from the Christian's perspective, uh, the things that I, I don't feel I'm an expert on this, but uh, uh, in, a, in a broad sense, how do we define end of days? I think there's a sense that there's a shift in what reality and what the world is going to be like at some point. And so in the scriptures, it uses the word end of days, uh, plural, and, and the last day. And so there's a distinction. So people who are into prophecy uh, and experts in this distinguish between maybe a, a longer time and a shorter time. So, but as I read uh, a lot of the articles that are coming out by theologians, um, initially uh, there was a lot of rhetoric, if I may use that word, about this is it, the world's gonna end. Uh, but I think uh, more and more people are saying, well, this is not it yet. I think this is an opportunity that God is giving us uh, to prepare ourselves in this time when the world has come to a standstill, including environmentally, uh, to prepare ourselves uh, for the days ahead, whatever they may be. So to so use it as a time of preparation. Uh, so there's a hope uh, tied into that conversation that I'm hearing these days. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, Islam teaches us that uh, only God has the knowledge of the unseen and the unknown. Uh, but I will say this, that uh, God has put into place the physical laws of nature as well as the spiritual laws of nature. And there's a perfect balance in those laws. As soon as you see an imbalance, uh, there are negative consequences of that. So what COVID has made us realize is that uh, we as human beings have to try our best to recognize the creator and recognize and be able to you know, live our lives balanced and another way of doing that is by fulfilling each other's rights. Great. Um, okay, so the next question again is for everyone. And I think we're getting close to being out of time. So this is probably the last question. But we are in a day and age where every country is focused on safeguarding their self-interest by hook or crook. Uh, how can we change that mindset? Uh, Caroline? I, I think the other panelists have, have spelt, spoken quite eloquently about uh, and forming families across nations and uh, thinking internationally. So uh, obviously this is the way to go. Okay. Uh, Pankaj. I would agree with that comment that I think uh, family of families, family of millions, and that's the way to go for this. And transcending all the borders, man-created borders of these countries. That's the way to go. Uh, David? Sorry, I'm with myself. Um, yeah, again, uh, similar uh, things have been shared before um, in terms of how do we learn to share, whether it is in our own family and how do we help those who are underprivileged uh, to, to, to come up to a place where we, we have equal uh, access to things or equal uh, opportunities. Uh, I think it starts right in the circle around us uh, um, and then uh, extends beyond that. If we have greater influence to speak uh, in places of authority, then let's use that for, for that. 
uh, if we are in uh, smaller avenues, maybe just leader in our home or in our community, let's uh, use that effectively. I think that's where it starts. And Asif. Continue striving to win the hearts of the people. Love for all, hatred for none is a, is a great message. And I believe this program, uh, you know, all of us together virtually is a great testament to that. Uh, if we continue along these lines, uh, we will definitely uh, be able to change that mindset and uh, establish peace in the world. Thank you, everybody, for a great presentation. Um, and I think great answers to these questions. Um, okay, uh, up next, I'd like to um, uh, call upon the president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat uh, for a thank you note. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the gracious and merciful. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and uh, peace, mercy and blessing of Allah be with you. On behalf of the MPA Muslim Jamaat and the organizing committee of the Virtual World Religious Conference, I want to, want to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to all our honorable guests and viewers who accepted our invitation and chose to spend the evening with us. I would also like, like to thank the presenters for their insightful and thought provoking presentations and messages, adding great value to this event. In present, present age, the importance of holding such forums has increased manifold, where religion is extensively abused to spread hatred and create discord among human beings. We are confident that such interactions would help to build the trust and support one another in challenges faced by humanity. We appreciate and value your cooperation in this noble cause and hope that it will develop further in times to come. As Muslims, we believe in the concept of integration it is an injunction, injunction of the Holy Quran to obey those who are in authority among you. Therefore, while we pass through these unprecedented times, it is important to follow the guidelines imposed by the authorities and observe physical distancing. Today's program is also an example of complying with the guidelines of the authorities to curb the spread of pandemic. It shows that we can continue community building efforts and come build the, build the trust and support one another in challenges faced by humanity. We appreciate and value your cooperation in this noble cause and hope that it will develop further in times to come. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our frontline health workers and first responders whose who are working around the clock while risking their own lives to keep us healthy and safe. Our prayers are with them. May Allah reward them graciously. I also pray that may Allah save the humanity from deadly consequences of this pandemic and enable us to recognize our creator and to fulfill the rights of the creation. With these words, I would once again thank all the participants and viewers for staying with us. May Allah bless you all. In keeping with the traditions of Islam, we conclude our programs with silent prayers. So I request all the Muslim, Muslim brothers to join me in silent prayers by raising their hands, whereas the others can pray in their own way. Please raise your hands and join me in silent prayers. I mean, thank you very much and good night. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, I, um, I think we've had great speakers. Uh, this, I, I, everybody that organized this, I think you did an amazing job. And, and thank you audience out there in cyberspace for joining us. Hopefully this has been thought provoking and I guess interesting and a little uh, solacing in these very strange times we find ourselves in. Good night everyone. <laughs>